Welcome to Ladies of Another View on Back. I am joined today by Jan and Carmen, and we have a guest today. It is Major General Eldon Jers. And if you haven't heard of Major Ge uh, General Eldon Jers, say that three times fast, by the way, <laughs> any one of you. <laughs> nope. All right, he is the fastest man in the world. And so I found you when I was doing the Haze in my hometown. Welcome to the show, Eldon. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. Well, so what brings you to North Dakota? Well, uh, we were asked to uh, speak at an event in Minot tomorrow. And uh, so as I thought about coming up here, I thought of other things that I might be able to do while I was back up in North Dakota, visit relatives and old friends and, and uh, talk to some folks in Hazen and then go to NDSU homecoming. Oh, my so, gosh. So that's what the week started out to be. It's changed uh, somewhat since then. But anyway, so that's what brought us up to North Dakota. Well, it's great to have you back home you know if i can say that great to have you home his wife is also in the studio so if i take a peek that way every now and then you know what i'm looking at <laughs> but anyway it is great to have you here it's just so exciting because when we did the my hometown we wanted to have you in that segment and it's like now wait a minute this story is a lot bigger than the five or six minutes that we would have gave you on the my hometown but hazen is a fantastic community and you must be so proud to be from that area i am i uh uh, I was thinking about that, and I really, I only lived there for uh, 11 years, but it seems like such a big part of my life. You know, those formative growing up years from grades 2 through 12, uh, all the people that influenced my life, they were great role models growing up in a little town. It has its disadvantages, but it has some really wonderful advantages as well. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a... Uh, and I'm very proud to have Hazen be my hometown. Amen. So we'll all kind of, we're good, just going to have a, a conversation, basically. Right. This isn't a hard sure. press interview by any stretch. But <laughs> I would like you to just start out by telling us what made you choose the military. Then the ladies will also pop in some questions. <laughs> so how did you choose military? <laughs> okay. Well, Give them the hardest <laughs> one first. So yeah. you, you know what's going to happen with this if you get me telling stories? The next thing you know, the interview time is going to be up, and I will have told one story. But so, so I'll try to cliff note version. Then. I'll try to keep this a little bit. So when I was about 15, I looked up in the sky one day and I saw a couple of airplanes flying around up there, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to be a fighter pilot? But I was from a small town in North Dakota, and uh, my parents had had an eighth grade education, both of them. So we had no college experience, and uh, so, but, so it seemed like a dream that was far beyond what would be possible for me. But it was still, it became my dream. And so I kind of went through the next portion of my life saying that I'm going to quietly pursue this dream, telling no one, quietly pursue this dream and doing things that would head me in that direction fully expecting that at some point along the way that I'd run into a, a barrier, a roadblock. And so it took me, it's what took me to NDSU, because NDSU had R Go Bison. Because <laughs> NDSU had ROTC, mm -hmm. and I knew that ROTC would get me into the Air Force if I qualified to be a pilot, into pilot training, and thus into being a pilot. So that's where I went, and NDSU and ROTC and pilot training, and so so there I was. I found myself a pilot in the Air Force. Wow. And now and, on Ladies of Another View. I mean, it's like and, life is and, and here I am. <laughs> right? And so I noticed, you know, you, you had many increases in your rank throughout the years. That you, How many years were you in the military total? 31. 31. And in that time, from what I read, you went all the way from your ROTC days to the pinnacle of being in the Pentagon, being in some very powerful positions within the military to be able to direct uh, the flow of things and some of the development of some of the programs. Am I right on that? Well, I mean, you probably gave me a little more credit than I really deserve, <laughs> but, but, but nevertheless, um, I, had a, I had a fun Air Force career. There, there was only a, a, really only one time that, that in, in that 31 years that I just didn't really enjoy going to work. I mean, I just enjoyed what, what I did. 
I love flying airplanes, and I enjoyed the other things that I did later in my career, uh, other staff jobs and, and commands that I had. Um, but um, uh, I did spend three assignments in the Washington area, two in the Pentagon, and one in the Department of Energy. And so those were, uh, if you're, uh, you certainly see what's going on and have an opportunity to participate in some of the planning and things that, that you do in the Pentagon. But I probably mostly enjoyed flying airplanes, first of all, and then second, commanding, being in charge of, of units or bases that, that conducted flying operations. It was just special, leading people, working with people, trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. uh, rather than politically expedient thing or things somebody else thought was neat. You know, just trying to do the right thing for the, for the country and for the people that, that worked with me and for me. So speaking of flying, you have this little title that says fastest man. <laughs> How did you get chosen for that well, test? Probably the biggest part of that was being chosen to fly the SR-71. So this is after Carol and I met and were married and I was coming up for assignment. We, uh, it's, another, it's another little story, but we ended up being assigned to the SR-71 in, out in California. It's a very small unit, so not very many pilots fly it at any one time, about 10 or so. And, um, and uh, so I became a qualified pilot flying missions in the SR-71. It's a reconnaissance airplane. So we would you know, fly around the, the world doing reconnaissance stuff. Sure. And uh, so in 1976, uh, some of the more senior people decided that it would be cool to have the SR-71 break, set some, break some uh, speed records, because it was a very fast airplane, obviously. So when mm -hmm. people say, what's the secret of breaking a record? I say, you have the to have airplane. a fast airplane, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. so There's so, always a catch, right? So yeah. you soup that up like you do That's a car, right? right? Absolutely. Put extra That's burgers absolutely. or whatever on it, right? So, so, so I had become one of the more senior uh, pilots in the program, a pretty, pretty small number, and so I was one of the more senior pilots when this was all going on. And so during that, that time, during the, for the bicentennial in July of 1976, we set, we set three records. We set the 1,000 kilometer uh, closed course, uh, the, the world um, sustained altitude record, and then the world absolute speed record. And, and I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to set the world absolute speed record. Wow. So, and so what is that, that record? It's 2,193 miles per hour. No way. Oh, oh and so, I can't fathom how that. Do I, you know, we, we might have to wait no. and take a break and talk about how that feels afterwards. <laughs> because yeah. I think a Top Gun, you know, were you Maverick or Goose, you would have been Maverick, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but there's so much more to talk about. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back after this on Ladies of Another View on Beck. Welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Beck. We are visiting with Major General Eldon Jers. And I can find, it, it kind of is a tongue twister, but you know, you get used to it. Uh, so we were just, before the break, we were talking about how you broke all the records. All right, so tell us how that felt when you're sitting in that cockpit and you're flying. What, what does that feel like for those of us on the ground? Well, the, uh, the SR-71 was, was quite a machine. It was a... Uh, way ahead of its time. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about a small town hero, I would say the designer of the SR-71 was Kelly Johnson. He was from a small town in, uh, in Michigan, or Michigan or Wisconsin, Michigan. Went to, the, went to Michigan State and he designed. He was, he's a legend in terms of aircraft design. So they, but anyway, they, he and his small team designed and built this airplane uh, that was made out of uh, more than 90% titanium that had never been done before that was able to fly and maintain flight at a very high speed, at, at a very high, high altitude, well before anyone else was able to do so. And so it became the airplane that came, gave the airplane a lot of capability, but also made it pretty impervious to defenses. And, but it was quite a machine to fly. And, uh, and so... Um, how, tell us how hot did it get when you were at that speed that broke the record 
as far as the plane itself on the outside. Yeah. It's fascinating. Okay. Well, the uh, the temperature right outside the, the cockpit area, so the, 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 f the front part of the airplane, was about, the average temperature is about 550 degrees Fahrenheit. And then as you got back, some of the hot parts of the airplane was, was hotter than that. But the airplane was definitely hot. It, uh, it, it was uh, one of the four folklores of the airplane is that it actually grew six inches or so, six to eight inches as it got warm because the metal expands wow, when, sure. it get, when it gets hot. And then when you slow down and it cooled down, it shrunk back. Back oh down. my goodness! So inside the cockpit, was it like uh, I think it's like over a hundred degrees in here? No, <laughs> or not? Well, uh, two things. One, it was, it was not. We it was air conditioned. They kept it, try and keep it about to seventy degrees. I was, you always flew in a pressure suit, and you had cooling air f flying into the pressure suit that kept it really very comfortable. But if you put your hand and you wore, you know, pressure suit gloves, which is kind of like a canvas glove, light canvas glove, when it, you put it up on the glass of the right beside you, you could only hold it there for a few seconds because it, it would get too hot. So, so this so was it, a, it was hot. This was a single piloted plane, correct? Single pilot, but we also had a, uh, uh, a navigator in the back seat, which was called, he was called an RSO, Reconnaissance Systems Operator. So when I, for example, when I broke the record, the, uh, my partner in the airplane was uh, GT Morgan, major, Major George Morgan, and I flew with a number of different backseaters in the five years I flew the airplane, but he was, he was my crewmate when we set the record. So tell so, us about the G-force then, getting back to when you were flying, like how does that feel? Because you could cross the United States in about two minutes, right? Yeah, G-forces occur when you accelerate. So when you were young and used to go, go dragging, you, you'd have a G-force pulling on you because you're accelerating. Right. The, the SR would go fast, but it didn't accelerate. Uh, during takeoff, it accelerated you know, pretty quickly. But, but once you got going and, and, ex and getting going faster and higher, there really w weren't any G-forces pulling on your body. And, and the turns were very gentle turns, so there weren't any G-forces in the turn. So your, uh, your sensations of speed were, were things like the ground is really going back, back fast, <laughs> you know, that, you know the visual cues. Or the instruments are telling you that, you know, they're, it's telling you you're going fast. So those physical cues aren't necessarily there like they would mm. uh, word in some other types of cars or planes. You know, so sort of I, in my, oh, I'm sorry, but in my brain, I'm trying to think, how do you take a slow curve at 2,000 miles an hour? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How does that You got happen? a lot yeah, of sky in right. there. That's right. So, so at, you know, 30 feet, just a, a 35 degree bank turn, which is our normal bank turn when you're at flying at Mach 3. The, the diameter of turn was 180 miles. So, oh. so if you just you know if you think about you know making a 180 or you know, going back that direction, so that diameter Williston, was 180 basically. miles. Yeah. So wasn't so. it on Top Gun when they talked about Mach one, and I always thought, boy, that must be really fast, you know? And now yeah. you're always talking Mach three. It's, yeah. It's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. So was there a big celebration when you got back after you set the record? Uh, well, there they had. People and cameras and interviews and things, yeah. So there was a, a certain amount of celebration, yeah. So, so the plane that you did this in, is it like in the Smithsonian now or any of the, whatever happened to that? There, till, uh, there was all the Blackbirds and there were uh, 45 built total between, there's a CIA version that preceded us and then about 30, 31 Air Force SR-71s. All those airplanes that, that weren't destroyed in a crash or something early on, there were about 10 of them were, but the rest of them are all in museums all around the country. The record, the, the airplane that I flew for the record was still number 958, and it's in a museum in Georgia at uh, Dobbins Air Force Base in Georgia. So hmm. it's cool. there. So was this plane around when you were in Vietnam? I know you had, you had missions in Vietnam and Laos I did. during mm -hmm. the war. Was that one of the planes that you flew during that time? No, uh, when I, gradu I graduated from pilot training in 1967 and I trained in an F-105, which is a single engine, single seat fighter bomber. It, its primary mission at that time was doing bombing missions over North Vietnam. So, so I flew that airplane for a year, 1968 to 1969, June to June, 68 to 69. And 
to 100 and about 60 or so, 58, I think, 50, 158 combat missions in North Vietnam and Laos. And the SR-71 was around. Its first operational mission, uh, flying a reconnaissance mission over North Vietnam, occurred in, uh, I believe it was, it's either March or May, I've, I've forgotten. Anyway, early in the spring of 60, spring of 60, six, of 68. So it was actually flying there in its very early uh, introduction to operational sorties in, mm. in 1968. But, but it was classified. I didn't know about it. I mean, I, I knew that there was a, a, a black mysterious airplane flying, but, uh, and I had a glimpse of one at one point when I was stationed at McConnell Air Force Base in Kansas. It had landed there for an emergency, and they took me down and showed me in the hangar, and just, you could just see it from a distance. You couldn't, even, couldn't get close to it at all. So, so I knew they were flying over there, but it was very classified and very... So what did so. they do? Was did it, it? It was a fighter jet. So then, did it have bombs under it? That or it didn't do the carpet bombing. It did. It shot other. Are you talking about the F one hundred five or the SR seventy one? The SR seventy one. SR seventy one was reconnaissance. The only thing oh. that. Only, oh, okay. We just had cameras. Yeah, oh. cameras and uh, and we would uh, had uh, sensors that would absorb or pick up data from radar signals and enemy defenses. But mostly we just took pictures, either you know radar pictures or, or wet wet film pictures. And mm -hmm. on uh, on one one sortie, one two, uh, two passes over North Dakota, we flew up. If we flew from west to east and then turned around and flew back east to west over North Dakota, we could photograph the entire state in one sortie, with mm -hmm. with wow. with one of our cameras. Wow. Yeah, it was it was it was a very very good. Uh, reconnaissance airplane. So when you think about yeah. technology back then, and yes. think about technology today, just think what is available. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Our iPhones take a really good picture is my point. Well. Just, if you had that kind of technology, yeah. you know what I'm saying? There's, but there's people out there that don't even know what he means by wet film. Yeah. True. Oh, yeah, that's right. Wet film is gone. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, hard to find. The old For fashion sure. photos. Okay, kids, anyone that's <laughs> <laughs> under the age of 40 or so. But I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to talk more with Major General Eldon Jers right after this on Ladies of Another View on Beck. Welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Beck. We are sitting with the fastest man in the world right here yeah. in the Beck studio, Major General Eldon Jers. So welcome back to the show. And it's just fascinating. We have conversation on breaks too, and it's like just so many questions. But uh, one of the questions we were talking about is the sound barrier. So years ago, growing up, we would always hear the sonic boom. Why doesn't that happen anymore? Uh, or how did it happen and yeah, why doesn't it yeah. happen? Yeah, I mean, so there is, when you break the sound barrier, when you go through Mach 1, there's a boom. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the speed of sound. And uh, it's just, I, I mean, the, why we heard it then and don't hear it now is because we were breaking the sound barrier back then. We had, uh, you had fighter uh, airplanes up at Minot that mm -hmm. were stationed nearby, and when they'd go out and train periodically, they'd break the sound barrier. And if an SR-71 flew over, even though we were very high altitude, you'd hear a boom. It was kind of a, and the SR, there was a double boom. It would go boom, boom. Uh, but oh, it, you know, it wasn't, didn't break windows, but you definitely could hear that there was mm -hmm. an airplane flying over that was breaking the sound barrier. So there aren't any fighter planes up in Minot anymore. Uh, and so you don't have anything uh, flying around here locally that are, fighters that break the sound barrier. That's, that'd be a simple answer for you here in Bismarck. Uh, I think another thing that I would say that it's become less uh, acceptable to uh, make noise. And so they, the military tries very hard to be sensitive to the population. And so even when I was flying the SR, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't fly over, uh, for example, large cities or national parks. Because they, we didn't want to disturb the serenity of of, the, of those parks, oh. and so we were sensitive to that. So we we would plan our route so that we didn't, you know, so we didn't, so we we weren't noisy. Uh, now the airplanes, uh, but you have, I mean, the F-22. I'm talking Air Force 
parlance, but the F-22 and the F-35 uh, and the F-16 and the F-15, they're all supersonic airplanes that fly supersonic occasionally for training, but they kind of do it over the water or they'll go down over the desert in Utah or New Mexico. Um, and, you, and you find those airplanes are stationed in places where they can go to a training range out over the water or over the wilderness and not and not disturb everybody. So I'm sorry they're not ah. disturbing you, but uh, you know I think you, that, you know that's kind of the reason. When you say that, weird question I know, but that's how my brain works. So <laughs> if you're flying in the mountains of Colorado or yeah. you know Alaska, could the boom have actually started avalanches? Because I mean it would shake windows sure. sometimes mm -hmm. back suppose. in the day. I think it could, sure. Yay! Yeah, I did it. <laughs> yeah. I nailed it. Okay. Yay. Yay, there you go. <laughs> well, I never thought I mean, about that I mean, before. We don't want to do that. You know? but, uh, You're never I'm, too old to learn, yeah, you know, right? It, you know. <laughs> so how did things, when you came home from the service in Vietnam, and, and first of all, thank you for your service. Thank I know you. We didn't yeah, get there. You. We appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I should say, uh, I'm a retired Major General, so, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, so <laughs> I, I served 31 years, and it was a great time, but but I did retire in 1997, so it's been quite a while okay. since I, I was on active duty, but thank you. Okay, so just to clarify even but for, I, for yeah. our viewers, it's like, yeah. so if you are retired, it's appropriate to say retired Major General. I should not address you as Major General. Is that? Yeah, okay. I, I, I write it as Major General retired, so Re okay. yeah, okay. so you. Because we want to be respectful, yeah, and yeah. that's something so, I yeah, never knew, and I bet yeah. a lot of viewers yeah. wouldn't know that, so, so thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. But I bet a lot of the, the whole political climate has changed from the time, even since you retired, but during your tenure, a lot of things changed. How they get started, how you move up in the ranks, all of those kinds of things. Any insight for someone that is looking to get into the Air Force? Um, yeah, so if I can think a little bit where Digest you're going. So when I came back from Vietnam in 1969, Sure. The war was very unpopular. For those mm -hmm. of you who are still re re remember yes, those sir. years, I and mean, we had protesters and and things. But truthfully, I was pretty oblivious to it. I mean, I knew it was out there, and I respected their right to protest. But it didn't bother me one way or another. I felt like my job was uh, a job that needed to be done. I was pr proud to serve my country. I never felt, oh, I'm really a bad guy because I'm because these people are protesting what I'm doing. I I love flying. Uh, I did the best of both that I could, to the best of my ability, and what I was assigned to do, and uh, and that's really kind of how I approached my job in in the Air Force through the years. I, I was I was very proud to be uh, serving my country and doing doing the right thing. I mean, there are times, but politically, when you're not really happy with the political leadership and things that they do, and um, you know, just recently, there's. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the way the withdrawal out of Afghanistan occurred. I mean, there, I mean, there's, it breaks people's heart to, to see it, and they, you can agonize over your view one way or another. But, um, but those soldiers that are out there following orders and, and doing the best they can at their job, uh, you know, I'm, I, 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 I pray that they are not uh, um, maligned because of, of what they did, because they're really just trying to do the right thing Amen. and trying to help people. And, you, and, you know, we have, we're, we're very proud of, of, uh, <clears throat> of America, what America stands for, freedom, uh, self-reliance, uh, make something of yourself, um, freedom of religion, things that we stand for, those are the things that are really important to me in the, in the time that I served in the military. Can I ask you a supposing question? If you were still in command of a unit or you know, some of the things that you've done in your career mm -hmm. and you had been in Afghanistan at that time, what, what kinds of things as a commander would you bring to your troops to help bolster them? Um, in a situation like that, I, and I don't know if that's too personal or if you just don't want to go there and you don't have to, but I think of that. I think of the people that were there at the time and how they process this and what kind of leadership things could a leader yeah. do to help that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah truthfully, uh, uh, it's, it's a hypothetical, first of all. Right, so right. when you're there, you 
digest it and you absorb what is going on around you and then you try and figure out what's the best thing to, to do for getting the mission done and taking care of your people. So, so for me to sit back here in an armchair, kind of yeah, quarterback, quarterback it is, okay. is, is pretty hard. But I think any of the commanders that are over there in that situation who have people uh, uh, he's, that he's responsible to and vice versa, they're trying to, to do what they've been asked to do the very best way that they can and protect those, protect those, those young men and women who, have, who they serve under them to uh, help them do their job. And I mean, this is a military, so the chance that you may die uh, doing your duty is very real. And we all know that when we, when we sign up. But, but we're not doing this on, we're not doing it willingly or on purpose or trying to throw our lives away. We're trying to do the right thing and to, and do, to do our job and to care for each other. We support each other, all doing the role that we've been trained to do, asked to do, and that we're responsible to do. And so, uh, you know, we, um, so anyway, I'm not exactly sure how else, how else to answer that, but that's sure. what I would say. Sure. Well, that's I appreciate perfect. that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So yeah, you've been through many administrations during your career then. All right. <laughs> and yeah. so you had yeah. to answer to you know, both sides of the aisle, but that aisle, it seems like, is getting wider. Or, yeah. You know, and, and maybe there's more <laughs> people. Fitting them all in, in it. <laughs> well, there's more people in the middle per se, but then you have the two, you know, the two far right and the two far left, and it's, it's getting to be confusing nowadays. Well, so, something that I would say that is kind of a bedrock principle for the U.S. military, all the services. Uh, certainly, I was an Air Force officer, but worked with other services as well. Kind of a bedrock principle is that we have a job to do, and it's, uh, we, t we take an oath that says we'll support and defend the Constitution of the United States and we'll obey the orders of the, those that are, are senior to us. Um, but we, uh, we hold very dear that, w that uh, in America, in our our principle of, of military service, that civilians are in charge, uh, not the military. So you're not gonna, hmm. you're not gonna find like other places around the world where there's a military coup. And the military guys uh, take over the government, get things stabilized, and then eventually maybe have elections and turn it back to civilians. That, that's not gonna happen in America because that isn't how we, view that our job is to to do our job and it's to defend America against you know uh, generally exterior uh, enemies and to to f fight battles if they have to be fight to defend us if we have to be defended and um, so we really try and stay out of politics either either side and that I know that we hear about and we read military officers, sometimes active duty, who do ex express their opinion, and they really should not. Uh, you can express your opinion, but you need to wait till you've retired or you're no longer wearing the uniform and then you can express your opinion. But, so we, sh we really should remain neutral, no matter sometimes how difficult it is. All right, well, we're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna pick up where we left off okay. right after this on Ladies of Another View on Beck. Welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Beck. We are visiting with retired General Major Eldon Jers, and I can say it, right here in the Beck Studios. And he's out of Dallas, but grew up in Hazen, and we're so glad to have you. I'm so glad that you stopped in. It's just, you're just a breath of fresh air. But before the break, we were talking about, you know, trying not to be non-political, and you just, you know, that's what you do. You just serve your country. But, so you wouldn't be taking secrets to China by any chance, right? <laughs> no, no, no. No. So that is not something that's appropriate in the no, military. Yeah, yeah. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just wanted to clear that clear yeah, that up for yeah, our viewers. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, um, and also during the break, I had mentioned that I have a nephew who does cybersecurity for the Air Force, and um, where what he does is he stops uh, terrorist attempts, and he was. I mean, he, he does a good job at it. So I just wanted to give a shout out to him because yeah, that's kind that's, of a big that's, deal. That's cool. I would just say, you know, that, and that's a perfect example. There's a, a bunch of specialties in the Air Force and the Air Force does such a good job of training young people when, when if you, if you uh, 
enlist in the Air Force, or you send your sons or daughters to the Air Force. They do such a good job of training you and prepare you for jobs like that, where you're really able to make a difference. I was so fortunate to be able to fly an airplane, and I love doing it. But there are all kinds of other uh, jobs out there that are very rewarding. And now we're, uh, we're branching into space. And it's just there, it's an exciting world out there for, for young people. And, right. and they'll train you well, and you, know, can ha you can have a great time and serve your country. Amen. So then I also wanted to say that um, before the show, you had a little visit with our CEO, Derek Bolawa. He's yeah. in the back room. And uh, did you want to recap any of that conversation? He told us you, you need to hit some of those highlights. He talked about <laughs> your military career yeah, because yeah. he was also, well, he called himself a military brat and just wondering if you guys had crossed paths and it hadn't, or the two families. But uh, so, so with Derek, uh, we went through year by year where, where I was stationed and we're trying to figure out if we crossed paths and things. So we, so we ended up talking about all the various assignments that I'd had in, in the Air Force, starting in... 1966 and ending, ending in 1997. So, so from <clears throat> pilot training in Del Rio, Texas, and F-105 training in McConnell, to a year in Southeast Asia and Thailand flying F-105s, combat missions in North Vietnam, to back as an instructor pilot where I met my wife in, in Laredo, Texas, to five years flying the SR-71, uh, school, Pentagon, back as a commander in the SR, um, back to school. And then I spent five years uh, in the bomber tanker world, B-52s and 135s at uh, Spokane, Washington, Minot Air Force Base mm, amen. for one year. Yeah, Minot. And, uh, and two years at Chaos Sawyer in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and then a Pentagon tour. Uh, and then back to fighters for one year, and then uh, um, two years in Italy, which was, which was fun for the family. and. Uh, quite an experience. And then the last two years in the Department of Energy doing uh, nuclear weapons stuff. So that was the entirety wow. of my career oh, in the Air Force. Oh, brings me to my question. <laughs> it says in your bio that you were part of the Tritium Project Office. Can you tell us what that is and what that involved? Tritium is a, an, an isotope, and it's, it's uh, necessary for, uh, to have a nuclear weapon work correctly. It has a ten and a half year uh, half life, so it so it every ten and a half years it's it has half as half as potency. So you so you have to continually re replace the tritium that uh, is stored or is is used by by nuclear weapons. Tritium is also on on no not these kind of watches, but are the old watches where that would gl glow in the glow in the dark sure. or strips on a highway that would glow. Yeah, that's sure. that's tritium. Okay. So uh, but but tritium it's uh, you have to um, uh, you have to wait to uh, to manufacture it. So you can do it. You can do a, uh, a neutron accelerator, uh, kind of a magic technology, or you can generally do it in a as a fuel rod in a nuclear power plant. But but you have to mine it out of the rods, and then you you they process it and they put it in a little cylinder, generally a little cylinder that's located inside a nuclear weapon, and when the when, when it goes boom, tritium makes it go big boom. Really big boom. boom. Big boom. <laughs> yeah, big boom. So, and so that's so. the same type of technology or, or production that they would use for like nuclear submarines as well, then, in their nuclear powered. No, because uh, in a nuclear submarine, that's a reactor. It's just a, it's, it's a reactor. They're using the nuclear heat source to generate steam, uh, heat. To power that that engine, it's kind of like a, it's, it's more like a power plant, a civilian power plant. But it's it's all very very well designed. And I'm not uh, for all those Navy guys that there's now these Navy submarines are going to say, what is this Air Force guy <laughs> talking about? He doesn't know anything. And, and they're right, they don't. But but anyway, I don't I don't think they they use tritium at all. But they have very 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 good. And very reliable. When's the last time you heard of a U.S. Navy nuclear submarine having a nuclear accident? Right. That's true. You know, it just right. doesn't happen. Right. I mean, because they're so good. The uh, the Navy nuclear submarine uh, community. I mean, they're they're so well educated and so well trained, and and you know, they just they just don't have incidents and accidents because they. Uh, they uh, th when they're very good, but they're also very safe about what they do. 
So I have a question. I can't help but notice your ring on your finger. This one? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's beautiful. So you're a Christian man, obviously. I am. And so tell us how the military and being a, a Christian man kind of helped you get through some tough times, I would think. Yeah. It's a, um, well, being a Christian is, I mean, it's probably uh, the most important. It's become the most important part of who I am. And uh, it definitely uh, is a key part of, well, it, it's a key part of, um, uh, of how I deal with life. And so you deal with life without you making yourself the most important thing. That you are, your, your, your obligation and your devotion is to the Lord. And so you live your life in, uh, in a way that, uh, that he leads you to live. And so th that very principle as you deal with responsibility and serving people and doing the right thing, being a man of integrity, it just goes hand in glove with serving your country and being in the military. So it was never, never a conflict. Wow, um, I had goosebumps. So, so. goosebumps. I had one more question too. And before we run out of time, we only have a minute, but. Well, we might stretch them out a little longer. Well, okay. <laughs> but I noticed, you know, you, over your career, you had received several awards. And I'm wondering if there's any particular award or a medal or, or anything that maybe held more meaning for you than others. If you had to pick one or is that possible? Yeah, I, uh, well, there were, I would say the Distinguished Flying Cross. So I've, I, I, just, I, re, I was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross three different times. You know, once for just general service and flying the F-105 in, in, uh, in Vietnam, and, and it was obviously written up for a, well, if, it, if you go, go back a long time ago, back in, from 1968, there was an article in the Bismarck Tribune that talked about a, a mission that we flew re rescuing a guy in North Vietnam. It's Lieutenant Colonel Jack Modica, who was one of my commanders. And that, that whole story about uh, um, providing uh, flak suppression as the helicopters picked him up in North Vietnam. That was quite, it's, it, it's an interesting story. And we got a, I got a distinguished flight cross for that. And I got a distinguished flying cross for the speed record. So I'd say, uh, you know, it's it's a special uh, flying. Uh, you don't have to be necessarily a pilot to get a DSC, but generally you're a pilot to get a distinguished flying cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's it's not the highest uh, flying award. You get you know, a silver star and medal of honor, etc. So uh, or the Air Force Cross, actually the silver star, Air Force Cross, and, and medal of honor. So, but it's a uh, um, it was a significant award for me that I, I was appreciating being awarded. All well-deserved commendation. Yes. yes. Thank you. So uh, just another quick question. We're going to keep you a little bit longer. Um, any advice for young kids today, just um, in general, whether they go into the military or not, just our families, they think, are kind of sort of falling apart in a way? Yeah, they Is are. Is there some advice that you would give to our young people? Yeah. So. Interesting. Uh, t tomorrow, I'm going to be going to Minot and I'm speaking to uh, 150 or so young people about about aviation. But what I also hope I have an opportunity to say to them is that um, it is uh, um, uh, <laughs> so the, the the title of this thing is Dare to Dream. So, so I have a dream, uh, and I talked. To, I, sh I told you my story about, but, but having this dream to fly. So, dare to dream, but, but don't just be a dreamer. Uh, uh, work through that dream and be responsible w with your life. Um, try and avoid the temptation to say, "Well, I'm young. I can do wild and crazy things." You know, try try and stay focused on where you're going. Develop a plan and. Just work through that plan to, with integrity and, and hard work. The rest of my dream story I, I, I want to share, and that is, so when I was 24, 10 years after my, my dream, I'd achieved my dream. Uh, I was a fighter pilot, and I was flying combat missions in Vietnam. 
What I didn't realize is that uh, while I'd achieved my dream, that I had not completed God's plan for my life. All that followed, followed after that dream. And I would say, it's, I still don't think it's over. I don't know what it is. Right. But anyway, so. so. Wow. We're all it's here powerful. for yeah. a time such as this. Yep. Amen. That's right. So I have goosebumps. I tell you, it's been a great show. But I do want to thank you and your wife, Carol, for coming here today and spending the day with us because it's just so interesting. And we appreciate you and your service to our country. Thank you very much.